My name is Dennis Davis. I'm an engineer, not a mathematician. I try to make my videos clear, but fast-paced. Vocabulary words are in yellow, outlined in the left panel. I'm going to cover the basics of set theory without dwelling on its many applications in fields such as logic, digital logic, including computer programming, discrete math, database theory, probability, linguistics, philosophy, and others. So here we go. A set is a collection of objects. If that sounds vague in general, well, that's on purpose. Sets are very flexible and can be used in a lot of disciplines, so the concept is broadly defined intentionally. The objects in the set are called elements, or elements of the set. Sets are denoted by capital letters, often italicized. The elements of set A can be pictured inside a labeled ring, like this. Or, we can syntactically declare the elements in a statement like this. We'll use the diagram style later when we talk about set operations. For now, we'll focus on various ways of defining sets with statements. This is an example of roster notation, where we define a set by listing its elements inside curly braces, separated by commas. This statement would be read out loud as, A is the set of 1, 2, 3, 4. Of course, once defined, a set can be referenced by its name or label. The elements of a set can be anything, such as numbers, people, objects, or even other sets. I'll mostly, but not always, use numbers when illustrating concepts in this video. Set elements are unique. No element is considered to be part of a set more than once. Every element is either in the set or not so listing an element more than once is meaningless. So the set 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 3 is actually the set 1, 2, 3. Additionally, set elements are unordered, so the set ABC is equal to the set CAB, which are both equal to set BCA, and so on. A set is a collection of objects with no implied order. When sets consist of numbers, we usually list them in order to make the membership clear, but the set itself is the collection of elements and not their sequence. Roster notation is very clear and explicit, but it can be inconvenient for large sets. For example, if set t contained the integers from 1 to 1,000, it would be quite tedious to write or read the list. If a list has a clear, unambiguous pattern, we can use an ellipsis, the dot 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 character, to substitute for part of the pattern. So we could write this statement to define set t as a set of all integers from 1 to 1,000. An ellipsis at the end of the series means the pattern continues forever. An ellipsis can also appear at the beginning of a roster list, or at the beginning and end. These denote infinite sets. Infinite sets have an infinite number of elements. Finite sets have a finite number. An alternative to roster notation is to simply describe the elements of the set within the curly braces. For example, M equals the set of calendar months. O equals the set of people who have walked on the moon. We can describe numerical sets too. S equals the set of integers from 1 to 1,000. The description should be precise and unmistakable. For example, the set of good songs would not be a well-defined set because not everyone would agree on the set's elements. There are several special predefined sets we can use in reference. There's a special set that has no elements. It's denoted by this symbol, a circle with a slash, and it's called the empty set, or null set. It can also be represented by a pair of curly braces with nothing between them. We'll mention the empty set a lot as we proceed. Another special set is the set that contains every element. When this set is referenced, it almost always has a context that limits its scope to mean every element of interest, such as the set of all students in a school, or the set of all rational numbers, or the set of possible five-card poker hands. This set that contains every element, well, every element of interest, is called the universal set, and its symbol is capital U. There are several predefined sets of different types of numbers, 
By convention, these set labels all have a specific, peculiar font called blackboard font that's characterized by double vertical lines. For example, an R drawn like this denotes the set of real numbers. You don't have to define this set. When you refer to set R in this special font, your readers will know it's the set of real numbers without additional explanation. Q, like this, denotes the set of rational numbers. The Q stands for quotient, which can help remind you that rational numbers can be expressed as the quotient of two integers. Speaking of integers, Z denotes the set of all positive and negative integers and includes zero. N is the set of natural numbers, or counting numbers, and apparently there's been some disagreement that's arisen since I was in school as to whether this set includes the number zero. Zero was not considered a natural number when I was a student, but now, decades later, some think it is, so be careful when using N. And C is the set of complex numbers, and those are the numeric sets you're most likely to encounter. Cardinality is the number of elements in a set. We express the cardinality of a set by putting absolute value bars around the set label. Like in other branches of mathematics, the absolute value bar means magnitude or size. This is read as the cardinality of set B. In this case, the cardinality of set B is 4. Remember, the elements in a set are unique, so the cardinality of set C is also 4. By definition, the cardinality of the empty set is 0. This is an example of an identity. An identity is an equation or statement that's always true. The cardinality of the empty set is zero, always, so it's an identity. I'll cover more identities as we go. Cardinality is like a function that takes a set as its argument and returns a number, the number of elements in the set. In fact, you may see cardinality represented by a lowercase n as a function with a set label in parentheses. I've also seen this hash notation to mean the number of elements in a set. Just be aware that in set theory, there's often more than one acceptable way to denote a concept. This is not the empty set. This is a set containing the empty set, which is one set. So the cardinality of this set is one. This kind of question shows up on quizzes and exams, so be wary. Empty set, empty set, set containing the empty set, so it's not empty. We can say that a particular element is a member of a set like this. 3 is an element of set C. This symbol, denoting set membership, can also be read as is a member of or is in. I usually say and think is an element of because the symbol resembles the letter E for element. To say that a particular element is not a member of a set, we use the element of symbol with a slash through it. 3 is not an element of set C. These statements can be turned around, so we can declare that a set contains an element, like this. Set C contains element 3, and set C does not contain element 3. We turn around the element of symbol and read it as contains element. This is much less common. You will most likely encounter statements in these forms. Item is or is not an element of set. Now we can introduce a third way to specify the elements of a set. In addition to roster notation and the description notation, there's set builder notation, which looks like this. This is slightly more formal than the first two methods, and for numerical sets, this is the format you're most likely to encounter in textbooks and papers. Set builder notation is declaring that any element, say x, is a member of the set as long as x meets the specified conditions. This would be read as set A is the set of all x such that x is an element of the set of natural numbers and x is less than 6. Set A is the set of all x, such that x is a natural number and x is less than 6. The variable is usually a lowercase x, but it can be any lowercase letter. Lowercase so it isn't easily mistaken for a set label, which is uppercase. 
As an aside, if you're working with complex numbers, it's conventional to use lowercase z instead of lowercase x. Not required, just a convention. The colon stands for such that. The algebraic expression after the colon must be true about x for x to be in the set. In place of the colon, a vertical bar can be used. It means the same thing, such that. If there are multiple characteristics, all of which must be true, they can be separated with commas, which denote the word and. In this example, each element of set A must be a natural number and be less than 6. Consider this set. B equals the set of all x such that x is less than or equal to 5. You might think B is the set of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, if x were a natural number. Or you might think B is the set of integers, from 5 down to negative infinity, if x were an integer. Or you might think B includes the infinite continuity of all real numbers up to 5, if x were a real number. If the type of number we intend for x is not clear from the environment, study, or problem being investigated, then we need to specify the type. There's a little shortcut we can use by specifying the type before the such that. For example, this statement is read, set b is the set of all x, such that x is less than or equal to 5. We can add element of n to the expression before the such that, and we get Set B is the set of natural X, such that X is less than or equal to 5. Or, B is the set of integer X, such that X is less than or equal to 5. These methods are all a little shorter than specifying the number type after the such that, as one of the conditions for X to be in the set. And the type of number is such a fundamental attribute of set B, it has a special place in front of the such that. It's not wrong to specify the number type after the such that, and it's only needed at all when the context isn't already clear. We can combine description definitions with set builder notation like this. P is the set of all x such that x is the square of an integer. Set builder notation is compatible with natural language specification, and we can still combine multiple conditions with a comma to specify that P only includes squares up to 100. We can also separate conditions with OR if either one can be satisfied in order for the element to be in the set. For example, the set of natural numbers up to 10 plus all the perfect squares can be expressed like this. Q is a set of integer X such that X is the square of a positive integer or X is less than or equal to 10. We'll talk more about AND and OR operators shortly. The complement of a set is the set of all elements in the universal set that are not in the set. For example, if the universal set is the set of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and set A is the set of 1, 2, and 5, then the complement of A would be the set of 3 and 4. The symbol for complement is the set label with a superscripted C. It's read as a complement. It can also be written with a prime character that looks like a single quote, and you might also see a bar over the set's label to denote its complement. Like I said, set theory often has more than one way to represent certain concepts. The complement of a set is another set. Let's check our understanding. The universal set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 has a cardinality of 5 since it has 5 elements. The cardinality of set A is 3, and the cardinality of A complement is 2. The cardinality of a set plus the cardinality of its complement will always equal the cardinality of the universal set. In set builder notation, the complement of A is defined as a set of all x such that x is an element of the universal set and x is not an element of A. Here are some more identities to know. The complement of the empty set, which can be written in either of these ways, is the universal set, and the complement of the universal set is the empty set. Now let's turn our attention back to the diagrammatic depictions of sets. This type of diagram is called a Venn diagram, with a capital V, since it's named after a person. In a Venn diagram, the universal set is denoted by a large rectangle that contains everything else we'll draw, 
to depict that the universal set contains everything. If the U label is drawn, it's near one of the corners. Sets are usually drawn as ovals or circles within the rectangle. We can place the elements of the set inside its oval to specify the elements, or we can refer to the set in general by shading its interior. This diagram references set A. When using shading, we don't need to say or even know what the set elements are. For example, this diagram references A complement, everything in the universal set that's not in set A, which is the definition of complement. Here's the empty set with nothing shaded. And here's the universal set with everything inside the rectangle shaded. For the rest of this video, we'll refer to Venn diagrams to illustrate the concepts being introduced. Here are two sets, A and B. If every element of set A is also an element of set B, we say that A is a subset of B. This is the symbol for subset. Here's a Venn diagram showing all the elements. All five elements are within set B, but only three are within set A. Every element of set A is in set B, so A is a subset of B. Notice that if we remove the individual elements from the diagram, the subset relationship is still clear. A is a subset of B because A is shown to be completely inside B. If two sets each have the same elements, they are equal, and they are subsets of each other, since, according to the definition of subset, the elements of one are also elements of the other. One implication of this is that every set is a subset of itself. That's an identity to know. Here are some other subset identities. The empty set is a subset of every set, and every set is a subset of the universal set. If set A is a subset of set B, then B is a superset of set A. Superset is the opposite of subset, meaning it contains all the elements of the other set. Here's the subset declaration, and here's how we express a superset relationship. The symbol is the reverse of the subset symbol. Naturally, the same diagram that shows A is a subset of B also shows that B is a superset of A. Here are more identities to know. They're the superset version of the subset identities. Equal sets are supersets of each other. Every set is a superset of itself. Every set is a superset of the empty set. And the universal set is a superset of every set. These superset statements are all exactly analogous to subset statements where the sets are reversed, since A is a subset of B always means B is a superset of A. However, if A is a subset of B and not equal to B, meaning set B has at least one element that's not in A, then set A is a proper subset of set B. The symbol for proper subset is the subset symbol without the bar underneath. Proper subset means a strictly smaller subset. So if set A is a proper subset of set B, then the cardinality of set A must be less than the cardinality of set B. For this reason, sets that are equal to each other are not proper subsets of each other, and a set is not a proper subset of itself. You can think of the subset symbol as being similar to the less than or equal to symbol. The bar underneath means the sides can be equal, and the open end points to the side that's bigger than the other one. With no bar underneath, the sides can't be the same. There are also proper supersets, again with the symbol reversed and the set labels reversed. The similarity to greater than can help you remember superset. Of course, the symbol for proper superset is the superset symbol without the bar underneath. Interval notation can be used as a shorthand version of set builder notation to describe sets that consist of continuous ranges of real numbers. For example, suppose we want to describe a set W that includes the numbers 0 and 1 and all the real numbers between. We could write this, W is the set of real x such that x is greater than or equal to 0 and x is less than or equal to 1. 
When a variable is between two inequality symbols, we can break it up into two pieces, separated with AND, since they're both true, and read each piece starting with the variable. 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1 is the same as x greater than or equal to 0 and x less than or equal to 1. So you might see either of these formats. On a number line, we'd represent the interval like this. The interval from 0 to 1 is highlighted, and the 0 and 1 values have small filled circles to denote that they're included in the interval. Again, interval notation lets us describe sets that are intervals of real numbers on a number line. If we did not intend to include 0 or 1 in the set, we'd write this, with less than signs instead of less than or equal to. On the number line, the endpoints are denoted with hollow circles to emphasize that the endpoints are not points of the interval. When endpoints are included, the interval is called a closed interval, and when they're excluded, the interval is called an open interval. These types of intervals are so common in the realm of real numbers, they have a shorthand. These mean the same thing. With interval notation, we can define a set without even using curly braces. The square brackets denote the closed interval. This compact statement means w is the set of real x such that x is greater than or equal to 0 and x is less than or equal to 1. When the endpoints are excluded from the set, the set expression uses round brackets or parentheses. A parenthesis denotes an open interval where the specified endpoint is not included. When one endpoint is included and the other isn't, this is called a half-open interval. Use one parenthesis and one square bracket on the appropriate side of the expression. Since these intervals are sets, we can use interval notation anywhere we would reference a set. Interval notation is a compact way to reference or define sets of continuous real numbers over a range. Now we'll move on to a new topic, set operations. Set operations are ways to create new sets from existing sets. It's a familiar concept. We can perform arithmetic operations on two numbers to get different numbers. And we can perform set operations on sets to get different sets. Set operators that deal with two sets are called binary set operations. Set operations that deal with only one set are called unary set operations. We've already covered one unary set operator, the complement. The complement of set A is another set, the set of elements not in set A. We've also covered cardinality, but cardinality is not a set operation because it doesn't result in another set. Rather, it's just the number, the number of elements in a set. And now we're going to cover the binary set operations, starting with intersection. Suppose set A is the set of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and set B is the set of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Each has five elements, including elements 2 and 4 that they have in common. We can depict these sets by overlapping them and carefully placing the elements they have in common within the area where their shapes overlap. Each set still has a cardinality of 5, and it's clear that elements 2 and 4 belong to both sets. This is a good time to point out that the relative areas of the shape don't correspond to the relative cardinality. So small areas can have many elements, and large areas can have fewer. Venn diagrams show the relationships between sets, not the relative sizes of the sets. This is how we write the intersection operation. This is the symbol for intersection. This is read as A intersect B. The intersection operation results in a set, the set of elements common to both sets. In formal set builder notation, the intersection operation is defined like this. A intersect B is the set of all x, such that x is an element of A and x is an element of B. You should be able to write this if asked and recognize that it describes the intersection operation. Here's a Venn diagram showing the intersection operation without referencing any particular values in either set. The shaded region represents A intersect B. Here are some identities pertaining to intersection. 
the intersection of a set with itself is the set. So A intersect A is set A. A intersect empty set equals the empty set. A intersect universal set equals set A. The intersection operation obeys the commutative law, meaning A intersect B is the same set as B intersect A. When two sets have no elements in common, their intersection is the empty set, and they're called disjoint sets. Disjoint sets have no elements in common. The intersection set operation is analogous to the logical operator AND, because an element must belong to both sets A and B in order to be in the intersection. In fact, very casually, this intersection is sometimes called A and B, because the elements in the intersection are in A and B. The next operation is union. Here's the symbol for union. It looks like a U, so it's easy to remember its association with union. Don't confuse it with capital U for universal set. The set builder notation is A union B is the set of all X such that X is an element of A or X is an element of B. So here are all the elements of A and here are all the elements of B. Any element that's in either A or B is in the union set. For this reason, the union operator is associated with the logical operator OR, because an element can be in set A or B to be in the union. Informally, this set is sometimes called A or B. As with all set operations we'll cover, you should be able to write the set builder notation for union, and when you see it, recognize which set operation it describes. The union operator obeys the commutative law because A union B is the same set as B union A. Here are the set identities that include union. The union of a set with itself is the set, so A union A equals A. A union empty set equals set A, and A union the universal set equals the universal set. Here are some memory tricks I used to help distinguish between intersection and union. The intersection symbol looks like a lowercase n, so you might remember intersection when you see it. The union symbol obviously resembles the letter U, so it's easy to associate the word union. Intersection is associated with the logical operator AND. Again, we can count on the resemblance of the symbol to lowercase n to remind us of the AND operator. Union is associated with a logical operator OR. This one's a little silly, but if you can picture the U shape forming the bottom of a rowing OR in a water, it can prompt you to remember the word OR. Sometimes the silliest things can be the easiest to remember. Another nice memory aid is to consider pouring the elements of the combined sets over the symbol between them. For the intersection symbol, many elements will roll off, leaving relatively few balanced on top. This is going to remind you that intersections are generally smaller than their constituent sets. For the union, the cup shape of the symbol captures all of the elements and none spill out, as a reminder that union includes all elements from both constituent sets. Now for some intersection and union sample problems. The universal set contains the integers from 1 to 10. Sets A, B, and C are as shown. Here are 14 sets for you to list the elements in each one. I don't want to slow down the video, so I won't go through each solution. But pause if you like to work these out, and I'll show the answers in a few seconds, and we'll keep going. If you're a student in school, there's a tricky type of question you might get asked, and I don't want you to be unprepared. Here are two small sets, true or false. Set A intersect set B equals 2. This is tricky because it's obvious that the element 2 is common to both sets, but the answer is false because intersection and union are set operations that result in sets. So the intersection of A and B is the set containing 2 as an element, not the number 2 itself. Don't be tripped up. These types of questions are common. Remember, set operations yield sets. 
The relative complement set operator specifies a set having all the elements in one set that aren't in another. Here's the Venn diagram, and here's the symbol, a backslash. The way the expression is read out loud is a little strange for this one. This can be read as A not in B, which is succinct and quite descriptive. The more formal name is relative complement of B with respect to A, which also makes sense, but the sets are mentioned in the reverse order to how they appear in the expression. Here's the set builder notation for relative complement. The relative complement of B with respect to A is the set of all X such that X is an element of A and X is not an element of B. You should be able to write this and recognize it as relative complement when you see it. Once more, if you're asked to write the expression for the relative complement of R with respect to S, remember that S goes in front of the slash and R goes after. S not in R is the same as relative complement of R with respect to S. Complement, slash, not in, all mean to exclude set R. Everything in S except what's in R. Let's consider this relative complement. Universal set, not in A. Everything in the universal set, except what's in set A. This should look familiar. It's the complement of set A we've already covered. Here's the set builder notation for the complement of A, A superscript C. And here's the set builder notation for the relative complement of A with respect to B. They're the same except for the included set. When the complement is taken against the universal set, it's called the absolute complement. And when a complement is taken against some other set, it's the relative complement with respect to that set. The relative complement operator does not obey the commutative law, since A not in B is not the same set as B not in A. The relative complement can be expressed using set operations we've already covered. A not in B is the same set as a intersect B complement, A and not in B. Another set operation is the symmetric difference. Here's the Venn diagram and expression. The operation symbol can be a triangle or a plus sign inscribed in a circle. Both are fairly common and they mean the same thing. The expressions can be read aloud as A delta B or A, X, or B, which I'll explain shortly in case you're not familiar. We can also say A symmetric difference B, or the symmetric difference between A and B. Here's the set builder notation. This symbol means exclusive OR, abbreviated XOR. It's a logical operator like AND and OR, but XOR means one or the other, but not both, which the Venn diagram illustrates. To be in the symmetric difference set, an element must be in either set A or set B, but not both. Like intersection and union are associated with the logical operators AND and OR, the symmetric difference set operation is, not surprisingly, associated with the logical operation XOR. The symmetric difference operation can be expressed using operations we've already covered. A XOR B equals A union B not in A intersect B. Here's A union B, not in A intersect B. The symmetric difference operation can also be expressed as A not in B union B not in A. Here's A not in B, union B not in A. The symmetric difference operation obeys the commutative law. The symmetric difference between A and B is the same set as the symmetric difference between B and A. Here's a summary chart showing our four binary set operations. Their set builder notation, logical word, and Venn diagram. We won't go over it here, but after practice, you should be familiar enough with these concepts to finish a chart like this. That is, given the set operation, set builder notation, logical word, or Venn diagram, write the others. Three of the binary set operations obey the commutative law, 
but the relative complement does not. A not in B is not the same set as B not in A, but the other three can have their set symbols reversed and still yield the same set. Binary set operations imply two sets, but we often can have more than two sets in a given problem. For example, suppose our universal set is students at university XYZ. We have graduate and undergraduate students. We'll let G be the set of graduate students. S is the set of STEM students, those majoring in science, technology, engineering, or math. And F is the set of female students. From these, how do we specify the set of students who are either graduate students or STEM students? Remember, we associate the logical operator OR with the set operator UNION, OR in the water, U-shape, UNION. So G UNION S is the set of all X, such that X is an element of G, graduate student, or X is an element of S, STEM student. And here's the Venn diagram. How about the set of male STEM students? The implied operator is AND, the set of male students and STEM students. Here's the set of male students, those that aren't female, F complement. Remember, AND corresponds to intersection with the set of STEM students. And here's the intersection. F complement intersect S. On the Venn diagram, you might recognize this as S not in F the relative complement of S with respect to F. In either case, it's the set of all X such that X is not an element of F and X is an element of S. Now let's consider a combination of all three sets. What's the set of female graduate STEM students? This would be F intersect G intersect S. This region represents the students in all three sets. The intersection set operator obeys the associative law, meaning we can perform the operations in any order. We can take F intersect G and then intersect that set with S. Or we can take G intersect S and then intersect that set with F. We get the same set regardless of the order in which we apply the operations because intersection obeys the associative law. The union operator also obeys the associative law. For example, the set of graduate students or female students or STEM students, F union G union S. We can identify F union G and then union that set with set S. Or we can start with G union S and then union that set with F. No matter the order in which we apply the union operator, will always get the same set, because union obeys the associative law. Without elaboration, I'll say that the exclusive OR operation also obeys the associative law. Here's the Venn diagram. When we operate on three sets with both union and intersection, we must pay attention to the order of operations, which we can establish with parentheses. Assume we see the set declaration F union G intersect S with no parentheses. This might mean F union G and intersect that with S, or it could mean G intersect S and union that set with F. As you can see, they're different sets, so be careful to use parentheses when needed and observe them when they're present. Expressions with union and intersection obey the distributive law meaning we can distribute the outer term into the parentheses like this. I'm sure this is familiar to you. 3 times 4 plus 2 equals 3 times 4 plus 3 times 2. What's outside the parentheses gets distributed inside. Same with intersection and union. So these expressions describe the same set. Here's G intersect S unioned with F. And here's F union G and F union S, and here's their intersection. It's the same set. So union obeys the distributive law. It can be distributed inside the parentheses. Now let me show you quickly that intersection works the same way. I'll write the expressions with intersection and union reversed, and intersection is distributed into the parenthetical terms. Here's G union S, 
intersected with F. And here's F intersect G and F intersect S. Here's their union. It's the same set. So the interset operation also obeys the distributive law. The next topic is De Morgan's laws, which are identities that involve the complements of sets. For example, the complement of A union B is always the same set as A complement intersect B complement. Put a little more plainly, the complement of the union equals the intersection of the complements. If we transliterate the symbols into their logical words, we get not A or B equals not A and not B, which is logically true. Reversing the union and intersection symbols yields another identity. The complement of the intersection is the same set as the union of the complements. Not A and B equals not A or not B. When given the complement of a two-set operation like this, we can write the identity by first switching the set operation from union to intersection or from intersection to union. Then we distribute the complement symbol to both sets. Of course, we can go the other direction too. When given the union or intersection of two complements, we can switch the operation and then collect the complement symbol to include the result of the operation. Let me show on a Venn diagram that these are always true. The complement of the union is the same set as the intersection of the complements. Here's A union B, and here is its complement. On the right side, here's A complement, and here's B complement, and here's their intersection. The sets will always be the same. The other identity switches the set operations. The complement of the intersection is the same set as the union of the complements. Here's the intersection of A and B, and here's the complement. On the right side, here's A complement, and here's B complement, and their union. The sets will always be the same. That's De Morgan's Law. The last binary set operation we'll cover is called the Cartesian product. It's also called the cross product, and you should know it by this name too. The Cartesian product has the X symbol like multiplication and is usually pronounced cross. So this is A cross B. I think it's easiest to understand the cross product by setting it up as a grid or matrix. Let's say set A is the set of letters A and B and set B is the set of numbers, 1, 2, and 3. We set up a grid with elements of set A along the left edge and elements of set B across the top. In each grid of the cell, we put the corresponding element from set A, then the corresponding element from set B, separated with a comma. The element from set A comes first because in A cross B, the A is first. We put each pairing in parentheses and continue in an orderly manner the pattern of crossing each element of A with each element of B. So the resulting set is the set of these six pairings. Each of these pairings is an ordered pair, a term you should know. An ordered pair is two items in a specific order, comma delimited, inside parentheses. You might also see angle brackets instead of parentheses. The cross product yields a new set whose elements are ordered pairs. Here's the set builder notation for Cartesian product. A cross B is the set of all ordered pairs X, Y, such that X is an element of A and Y is an element of B. Ordered pairs are not sets. Sets are denoted with curly braces. This is the set having one and two as elements. This is an ordered pair, one followed by two. The set 1 and 2 equals the set 2 and 1, but the ordered pair 1, 2 is not equal to the ordered pair 2, 1. Order doesn't matter inside sets, but order does matter for ordered pairs. This is a set whose element is one ordered pair, and its cardinality is 1 because there's one ordered pair, not 2 because there are two numbers. An ordered pair is an element. Since A cross B combines every element of A with every element of B, the cardinality of A cross B equals the cardinality of A 
times the cardinality of b. In this case, 6 equals 2 times 3. This is really the definition of multiplication. The Cartesian product does not obey the commutative law. a cross b is not the same set as b cross a, but their cardinalities are the same, since in this example, 2 times 3 equals 3 times 2. You may recognize the term ordered pair as corresponding to the coordinates of a point you'd plot on a Cartesian coordinate system. Here are two set theory vocabulary words in a context that we're already familiar with. Let me show you the relationship. Remember, the set R is a set of real numbers, which we can represent by a number line because every element of R is a point on the line. Now, let's consider the new set R cross R. It's a set of ordered pairs x, y, such that x is an element of r and y is an element of r. We can create a grid having a horizontal and vertical r, each represented by a line, so that each point in the plane is represented by an ordered pair of the Cartesian product. And that's why it's called a Cartesian coordinate system. The points are the Cartesian product of the two real number lines. Sometimes r squared is used to denote a two-dimensional plane, and r cubed to denote a three-dimensional space. The last topic we'll cover is the power set. The power set is a unary set operation, meaning it operates on only one set. It's written like this, with a frilly p, so it isn't confused with the probability function. The power set of s is the set of all subsets of s. For example, if S is the set of letters A and B, then the power set of S is the set of these four sets. The four possible subsets of S, the power set always includes the empty set and the set itself, plus all the other proper subsets. If S is the set of 1, 2, 3, then the power set of S is the set of these eight subsets. Here's a method I use to make sure I get them all. Underneath a list of elements, write the binary numbers, starting with zero, having as many digits as the number of elements in the set. Since set S has three elements, I write the three-digit binary numbers, which represent the decimal numbers zero through seven. Each binary number represents a subset of S, containing the elements corresponding to the ones. The first row has no ones, so the set it represents has no elements, the empty set. The second row just has a 1 beneath the element 3, so it represents the subset having just the element 3. The next row corresponds to 2, and the next row has two ones under 2 and 3, so it represents the subset 2 and 3. And the pattern continues for all eight binary numbers, and this yields the power set. The cardinality of a power set depends on the cardinality of the underlying set. We've already seen that a set with two elements has a power set having four elements. And a set with three elements has a power set having eight elements. Adding an element to S doubles the cardinality of its power set, because each previous subset has a twin that also includes the new element. In general, the cardinality of the power set of S equals 2 raised to the cardinality of S. That's the end of this introduction to set theory. It's longer than I'd hoped, but there was a lot of material to cover. Hopefully you have a good foundation for your coursework or self-study. If you thought this video was worth your time, I hope you'll consider giving it a thumbs up like. And if you'd like to know when I push more videos, I'd appreciate your subscribership. Good luck with your studies.